Good morning. I'm Ellison Barber. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, make or break, President Biden's multi-trillion dollar agenda remains in limbo this morning as all eyes shift from a shutdown showdown between parties to an infrastructure standoff among Democrats. A crucial vote in the House delayed overnight as the rift widens among Democrats. We'll bring you the very latest from the Hill on this Friday morning. Emergency condition. Hospitals are facing worker shortages in a pandemic. Some employees are holding out, opposing COVID vaccine mandates. Some are even losing their jobs. Our report from one New York hospital system that suspended and even terminated 5% of its staff because they wouldn't get the shot. Endless state battle. Texas parents of transgender children are drained. They say their kids are traumatized. We'll talk to one mom who's taken protecting her child's rights into her own hands, making it her mission to fight off dozens of state bills targeting transgender kids. But the question from her, when will it end? Setting an example, our own team members here at NBC News Now are shining this Hispanic Heritage Month, sharing stories of their personal history. We asked our producers to share what representation means to them and how they bring their pride to work every single day. And we are so proud of them for doing so, and we're so happy to have you with us this morning. So excited to be here. It's nice to see you in person. I know, you've <laughs> been, our audience knows you, you've been on the show, but we've actually never anchored together before. Very so excited. I'm so happy to be with you. Thanks for having me. We begin this morning with more drama on Capitol Hill and growing divisions in the Democratic Party bursting out into the open. Yeah, Congress was able to step back from the edge of the cliff by voting to avert a government shutdown last night. But in another twist, House Democrats delayed to vote on a massive infrastructure bill, a rare setback for Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who scheduled a vote on the bill yesterday. Yeah, it's all because of an ongoing standoff between the centrist and progressive wings of the party. The two sides are at odds over that bill, as well as a three and a half trillion dollar social safety net package. And despite the deadlock, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said both sides are close to a deal. After hours of meetings, the two sides still seem trillions of dollars apart. How do you bridge this gap? We're not trillions of dollars. How disappointed are you that there is no vote tonight, Madam Speaker? We'll have a vote today. We'll have a vote today. There'll be a vote today. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it. Thank you. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins us now, along with NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Good morning to both of you. All right, so Lee Ann, let's start with you. We just heard from Speaker Pelosi there that a vote is expected to happen today. Tell us why it was postponed in the first place and sort of break down, if you can, the main points of tension here between centrist and progressive Democrats. Yeah, good morning, Savannah and Ellison. So this is a debate and a divide between the party, between progressives and uh, the moderates in the party. The reason is because there's two pieces of legislation as well. The moderates want to vote on this scheduled uh, vote on the bipartisan traditional infrastructure bill that will fix roads and bridges, create broadband uh, electric vehicle funding. And the moderates say, look, we also want a bill on the or a vote on the rest of the Biden agenda, which is this multi-trillion dollar human infrastructure bill. So it's a social safety net bill with climate change policies. And they say all or nothing. And so they are holding up a vote on this bipartisan traditional infrastructure bill until there is a lot more progress on the other bill. And at this point, they are still working and still negotiating with both sides of the Democratic Party to come to an agreement. And so while Speaker Pelosi says there's going to be a vote today, uh, they're still very far off from even reaching agreement. So it could take a while. Yeah, it certainly could. And Mike, let's bring you in here now. President Biden has to be relieved that a shutdown has been avoided. Of course, that's some good news. But politically, this isn't an ideal situation for him or his agenda, as has been the truth for a while now with all this gridlock. So how is the White House reacting to the internal wrangling within his own party over this bill? Well, good morning, Savannah. First, I should mention it's not Wednesday, but it is now Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October. So you can see the White House has made a light shade of pink uh, for, in honor of this month. Uh, there were some lights on here late at the White House as well into the night as they were awaiting word from Capitol Hill of whether a deal was going to be reached here. That did not happen. Obviously, the White House is working the phones from here. There are also a number of officials who were in the offices in the Capitol there with leadership late into the night. Uh, we did see a statement come in from 
from White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki saying a great deal of progress has been made uh, this week, and we are closer to an agreement than ever, but we are not there yet. They said that work will continue again here first thing this morning. We're waiting to see uh, if we might see some more direct engagement from President Biden. Obviously, we know he's had multiple meetings over the course of the week with those two key senators, Senator Joe Manchin, Senator Kirsten Sinema. We have not seen him go up to Capitol Hill yet, which is something we're expecting potentially that could happen when an agreement is reached to try to see the final vote through. But obviously, as Jen said, we're not there yet. Mm. And, Leah, this delay is seen, at least by progressives, as a win, it appears. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal tweeted earlier that by allowing one bill to advance without the Build Back Better Act, we leave behind child care, paid leave, health care, climate action, education, and a roadmap to citizenship. We're not going to leave working people, families, and our communities behind. So what do centrist members make of that? And what are, if you'll gamble for us, the chances that we could see some sort of deal today? Yeah, so I think that the centrist members really underestimated the strength of the progressives and the determination of the progressives. They thought that they could push through this bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is their priority, and they didn't think that progressives would have the numbers to block it and the willpower to defy Speaker Pelosi. Now, late into the night, senators were there, too, and part of these negotiations, including Senator Joe Manchin, and this is what he told reporters leaving the Capitol. You know, I've never linked the two bills together, and, I'm, and pray to God that let's look at each bill with its own merits. There's a lot of good in both of them. We should be able to, to come to that agreement. And he doesn't want these bills linked, but the progressives do because they don't trust people like Senator Joe Manchin to support their priorities if the progressives set, uh, support Senator Manchin's priorities. Now, progressives want $3.5 trillion. Manchin wants $1.5 trillion. And that's what they are trying to work on now is coming somewhere in the middle. And, Mike, quickly, how much of a blow would it be for the president if a vote didn't go ahead today or if it ultimately fails completely? Well, a year ago today, President Biden, then candidate Biden, was finishing up a train tour called the Build Back a Better Express. This was the core of his campaign message, arguing that he would deliver a big infrastructure package, expansion to some of the social safety net programs, climate pr provisions as well. But more than that, President Biden promised he would get Washington working again. He would be able to work with Republicans. He's been able to do that to some extent, but now the problem is within his own party. So the White House would certainly accept a delayed vote if it means ultimately getting the deal. But if this ultimately does does fail and he doesn't even get that bipartisan infrastructure plan, it's a big blow to his presidency for sure. All right, Leanne Caldwell and Mike Mimoli, thanks for that. Thank you both. All right, and now battles brewing over vaccine mandates in New York. Hospitals are seeing the size of their staff shrink after employees were either terminated or they quit following the vaccine mandate that went into effect earlier this week. According to the State Department of Health, 16 percent of hospital workers, 15 percent of nursing home staffers and 14 percent of adult care facility employees are not fully vaccinated, as you can see there on your screen. All of those employees are now at risk of losing their jobs. The lack of staff has forced some hospitals to make drastic decisions when treating patients. Hospitals like Erie County Medical Center have stopped elective inpatient surgeries and ICU medical transfers. Others are turning away patients as they continue to battle COVID. In rural communities, the struggle to keep hospital doors open is even greater. NBC News correspondent Heidi Presbella joins us now from outside a Mohawk Valley Health System Hospital in New Hartford, New York, with more. Heidi, good morning. So first, let's talk about exactly what's happening at these hospitals as they lose staff, the challenges that they're facing. Now that employees are being fired for refusing vaccination, what should patients expect? Yes, yeah, Savannah, Monday was the deadline for all New York healthcare workers to comply with that vaccine mandate. And we're seeing the impact is especially strong here in upstate New York, where here at the Mohawk Valley High System, they've already had about 5% of their workforce. That's about 180 employees who are now out on unpaid leave. And Savannah, the biggest issue is not necessarily the vaccine mandate impact, but it's the fact that it comes on top of what was already a dire staffing shortage. Take a listen here to what the CEO had to say. 
So we've had to cut back some hours. We've consolidated some services together. We've cut back support systems, and we're telling our population that they're going to uh, have to suffer some from the wait time. It presents a greater challenge to us because at the same time, we're also seeing that hospitalization rates are up. Our ERs are busier than they've been ever. And uh, so it's sort of a double whammy. We have fewer employees, we have more patients. Savannah, the vacancy rate here, even before the vaccine mandate took effect, was about 14 percent. So you can see that any kind of give there is going to have a dramatic impact on their staffing and their capability to deliver services. It's really a combination here, a perfect storm of burnout, people taking higher paying jobs and retirements. And with all of that, I can imagine that it's affecting morale. I mean, how are hospital employees doing that are still working there that did get the shot? And then also for those who change their mind about refusing the vaccine, let's say they decide they do want to get it or they feel comfortable now or they just want their job back. Is it possible for them to get their job back? Yeah, look, a lot of these people are on unpaid leave until October 9th. So when we talked to the CEO, she said, we're hopeful that ultimately a lot of them will come to that decision to get the vaccination. She put them in buckets. She said, look, there, there is definitely a hardcore hell no bucket of people who say my body, my choice, I'm not getting it. But a lot of them are people who just didn't get around to it, were busy. And then there was mm -hmm. another bucket of people who just need these one-on-one -on -one conversations, Savannah, to be convinced there's a large immigrant community here, as she said, for instance, and that that was really effective for them to just sit down and say, hey, here's the truth. Here's the disinformation. You need to get the shot. And now, Heidi, I wonder, did the vaccine mandate have any impact on the vaccination rate there among healthcare workers overall, did the mandate mean that more of them got this shot? And also, are we concerned at all about this affecting vaccine hesitancy when we hear that healthcare workers aren't getting it? Yeah, you know, I assumed when I asked the CEO, hey, you're losing 5% of your workforce here potentially. Do you oppose this vaccine mandate? And she said, no, it's been great because we've gone just within a matter of weeks from a vaccination, unvaxed, unvaxed rate of about 30% to now about 5%. Mm. And so the issue here really is not the vaccine mandate itself. It's the amount of time that they're being given to get people to comply. Here's what she said. My advice to everybody who's going to be facing a mandate, start now, start now, and do it one employee at a time. The personal approach really matters. When we came back to work on Tuesday, and people were working and going about and doing their jobs, it was like a collective sigh of relief. And we became the organization that we were before that. So I think this week has been a real positive week. So here's the thing, Savannah, they are suffering. They have had to cut back some services. They have warned people that if you're not really sick, don't come to the emergency room, for instance. So this is having real impact, not to downplay that. But ultimately, she's hoping that by October 9th, that bucket, as she called it, of people who are just adamantly will not get this vaccine is going to be a small number. This is going to be a very interesting test case to see how this mandate will play out all across the country, given that New York State was kind of ahead of the mm -hmm. game here with its own mandate, Savannah. It certainly will be something to watch, and we know you'll be on it. Thank you. Important reporting there. Heidi Presbella. Meanwhile, the legal fight between health care workers and Governor Kathy Hochul is heating up. She's facing several lawsuits following the announcement of the vaccine mandate, including claims that the mandate is unconstitutional. One union representing state hospital security workers is calling for a temporary restraining order against the state to try and stop hospitals from enforcing the vaccine requirement. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas joins us now to break down this mandate. Danny, good morning. Glad you are here to kind of put all this in perspective for us. The governor, she is standing by her decision to enforce this mandate. Listen to what she had to say yesterday, and then we'll talk right after. My number one job as governor is to keep the people of the state safe. And that is why we were very firm in adhering to the vaccine mandate that as of Tuesday, actually midnight on Monday, Tuesday, uh, health care workers all across New York in health hospitals and nursing homes were required to be vaccinated. 
uh, it was the right thing to do. I will stand with that. Okay, so legally speaking, is Governor Hochul able to mandate all healthcare workers get vaccinated or do some of these lawsuits we're hearing about? Do they have merit? Governor Hochul in the state of New York could probably require that every single one of us in New York, including you and I, uh, get vaccinated. And I only say that because for over 100 years, the Supreme Court has said, uh, since a case named Jacobson v. Massachusetts in 1905, that the government, in times of emergency, can force citizens to get vaccinated. Back then, it was smallpox. Today, it's COVID-19. So the government's power to do so seems pretty well established in times of emergency. In terms of employers, and particularly in the healthcare context, generally, they can mandate vaccines with exemptions for uh, Americans with Disabilities Act or religious exemptions, which is a hot issue right now. Okay, well, let's talk about those exemptions then. You mentioned that it does include religious as well as medical exemptions. How difficult is it to get an exemption in New York? And at this point in time, are people who don't want to get vaccinated using it as a bit of a legal loophole? Fortunately, the law recognizes the possibility of that loophole. So somebody can get a religious exemption if, number one, they have a sincerely held religious belief, and number two, uh, that it is uh, a reasonable accommodation. The employer is only required to reasonably accommodate the employee. They don't have to do anything and everything the employee wants or says they need in order to comply with their religion. So that first element, they can actually look into whether or not the person has a sincerely held religious belief. Have they gone to church? Is this for real? But beyond that, no matter what, even if their belief is as sincere as it comes, uh, an employer is not required to adhere to every request that the employee wants. It has to be reasonable. Now, of course, the courts have litigated what is a reasonable accommodation for decades, if not centuries now. Hmm. All right. Well, fascinating stuff, Danny. Thank you so much for that. Let's now bring in Dr. Susanna Hills for more on this. She's a board-certified pediatric airway surgeon at Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Hill, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. So now 16% of New York's hospital workers are not fully vaccinated. We have been talking for the last 17 minutes about how many are quitting their jobs because of this new vaccine mandate. So two questions for you here. The first, are you surprised by how many healthcare workers are refusing to get vaccinated, especially since the FDA has fully authorized the Pfizer vaccine? And also, are you concerned about what this can do for hesitancy? Because I can imagine someone who's on the fence hearing their nurse or doctor isn't getting it and think, well, should I? Savannah, if you had asked me last year when we were at the height of the surge here in New York, if I thought people would, who were working in that environment, taking care of all these sick patients in that really devastating setting we were dealing with, if, I, if you'd asked me, do I think anybody would um, be hesitant to get a vaccine if it were available, I, w I would have said no. So from my perspective, yes, it's surprising. But... Also, we have to remember that these, all of these healthcare workers who, who were with us last year, standing with us, taking care of all of these really sick patients, they were an essential part of this team. They're a really valuable part of our healthcare system and our community. And it's a big loss to, to lose any of them because of, uh, of feelings about getting vaccinated. So it's really difficult. Um, and, you know, everybody has their own perspective on this and, um, you know, we have to respect people's decisions if, if they feel they, they need to, to leave, um, if they're, they're not comfortable getting vaccinated. It is a little concerning the message that it sends, um, but healthcare workers, staff here in the hospitals, they're like people anywhere else uh, with the same um, concerns sometimes. And, you know, with the right to, to make their own decision if, uh, if they feel they can't get vaccinated and need to leave. Mm. Uh, Dr. Hill, I mean, you know, one thing that is interesting is it's when we're talking about healthcare workers, it is worth noting it's not always just doctors or nurses. It kind of really does run yeah. the gamut. And I have been in a number of ICUs yeah. where when I'm talking to people who cover this day in and day out, I've yet to meet a nurse or doctor specializing in this who says they have Especially, not gotten right, vaccinated right. yet, which is interesting. But I mean, you know, when you look at these numbers, we're talking so much about them. But Dr. Hill, from your perspective, are the numbers of people leaving, is it concerning to you? Governor Hochul, she has said that she plans to potentially fill the void if needed by deploying the National Guard or bringing in people from other mm -hmm. states. Uh, what's sort of your take on that and what would that mean for patients? 
Yeah, yeah, it's you know 450,000 healthcare workers. It's a huge number, um, but the good news is, you know, if you look at our healthcare system here at NYP, a month ago there were about 30 percent of our hospital employees who weren't vaccinated after the mandate. That went down to one percent. So, so 99 percent of people here at NYP ended up getting vaccinated, and the same thing is, appears to be true in most healthcare settings with the mandates. They are effective in getting the vast majority of people vaccinated. But there is still that huge number of people who who work in the healthcare system who aren't fully vaccinated. Um, and last year for us, we brought in the military to help support our healthcare system when we were really feeling that crush mm. of, uh, of the surge of COVID here. And they were amazing. They came in, built our Ryan Larkin Field Hospital. It was incredibly functional. It was a huge relief for our hospital. Um, I had a team that I led with four uh, special operations team members who um, were military medics who were brought in and they were invaluable. You know, they came around and helped we manage our airway patients and our tracheostomy patients here um, in the hospital who had had COVID. So I think it's a, a, a great answer. They um, they are a huge support when we need them, and I think it, it will be uh, a good response to this. Yeah. All right, Dr. Susanna Hills, your expertise and your time is so appreciated this morning. Thank you for joining us. An emotional hearing on Capitol Hill as more and more states work to pass restrictive abortion laws. Lawmakers listened to hours of powerful testimony, including some from their own colleagues. NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson has the story. The emotion obvious, even before Congresswoman Cori Bush spoke a single word, revealing publicly for the first time her own experience with abortion, describing being raped on a church trip just after high school. I found out that I was nine weeks nine weeks pregnant, and then there the panic set in. How could I make this pregnancy work? My abortion happened on a Saturday. I felt alone, but I also felt so resolved in my decision. Choosing to have an abortion was the hardest decision I had ever made. I but at 18 years old, I knew it was the right decision for me. Her testimony coming during a congressional hearing led by Democrats, several of whom shared their own stories, meant to highlight the need to fight restrictive new abortion laws, like the one in Texas that effectively outlaws abortion after about six weeks before some women even know they're pregnant. What do you hope to get out of sharing your testimony and sharing your story today? What do you hope happens from that? Well, what I really hope is that people across the country understand how close we are to losing this incredible incredibly important and necessary constitutional protection that we have. I'm hoping that every time we speak and we're vulnerable in this way, it changes hearts and minds. A majority of Americans support legal abortions in all or most cases, but one abortion rights group says lawmakers in at least 11 states hope to use Texas as a blueprint for similar restrictive abortion bills. Republicans who oppose abortion rights vocal, like Congresswoman Kat Kamek, who described her own mother's decision not to terminate her pregnancy. I would not be here had it not been for the very brave choice that my mother made. 33 years ago. There's been a lot of talk about justice here today. What about the justice for those unborn? All the little girls that never had a shot. As for what's next in the fight over abortion access, a key Supreme Court decision that a lot of people are watching for, the justices this term are set to take up a case that could overturn Roe versus Wade, that landmark decision protecting abortion rights. Savannah Ellison, back to you. Allie Jackson, thanks so much. Now to Facebook under fire, the social media giant is facing intense questioning from both sides of the aisle at a hearing on Capitol Hill. This comes after it was revealed their own research showed the Instagram app can be harmful to children's mental health, especially young girls. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has more on the heated confrontation with lawmakers. On Capitol Hill, Facebook and its Instagram app under blistering bipartisan condemnation. Facebook knows that its services are actively harming young children. How can we or parents or anyone trust Facebook? Have you quantified how many children have taken their own lives because of your products? 
Facebook's head of global safety appearing remotely and on the defensive after the Wall Street Journal revealed internal Facebook research found one in three teenage users said Instagram has contributed to their own body image issues, eating disorders, anxiety, and depression. Among teens who had suicidal thoughts, 13 percent of British users and 6 percent of American users traced those thoughts to Instagram use, though Facebook insists far more teens benefit from the social connections. More of them found their engagement on Instagram helpful than, than harmful. But 20-year-old Grace Park believes the constant Instagram posts contributed to her own anxiety and eating disorder in high school. Everyone else is way skinnier and way prettier and have nicer clothes, and that also sort of hurt my own self-confidence about my own body, which led to me practically starving myself for like a year. It makes them feel like they're on shaky ground and that they can't possibly keep up with their peers or anyone else. And it, it just makes their insecurity snowball at a time when they're very vulnerable. Facebook, Instagram had a plan to roll out a younger version of Instagram to eight to 12 year olds. They've now put that on pause uh, on the heels of this Wall Street Journal report about the negative mental effects that we're seeing with teenagers and Instagram. But it is only on hold. Instagram would still like to roll out that younger version of Instagram as they now have more and more enemies on both sides of the political aisle in Washington threatening legislation. Savannah and Ellison, back to you. An important report. Tom Costello, thank you so much. And now let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather, Bill Karens, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good chilly morning in a few areas of the country. I know everyone in the Northeast has their heaters on for probably the first time this season. So now that we're in October, here's your October outlook. And this shouldn't surprise anyone. We're looking for warmer than average temperatures almost across all of the lower 48. We're not expecting below average temperatures anywhere. So expect a milder October than you're used to. And the wetter areas, unfortunately, it looks like on the East Coast, uh, the Great Lakes, and in the Pacific Northwest. We'll take it in the Northwest west because that'll help with the drought conditions and with the fires in those areas but for the great lakes and the east coast we don't want that wet weather because that's when the leaves are heading towards their peak and the rain takes the leaves down quicker so as far as the rain goes today we're focusing really in the middle of the country again texas has had a lot of rain overnight thunderstorms rolled through san antonio victoria they're still around corpus christi houston you're going to be dodging showers and storms on and off throughout the day today and then as we go through tonight for your evening plans watch out areas of arkansas with some storms tomorrow morning st louis could have some rain along with chicago and then during the day saturday all that rain heads through the Ohio Valley. So for today's forecast, after a chilly start, a nice warm up in the afternoon in, in the Northeast. Coming up next hour, we'll take you through the complete weekend forecast, guys. All right, that's a tease we always like. Thank you, Bill. See you in a little bit. Thanks, Bill. And coming up, hunger, exhaustion, and kidnapping, heartbreaking mm. stories on the road to the U.S. border. That's right, our partners at Telemundo will take you on the perilous journey migrants and refugees face while trying to make it to the United States. That's next. Welcome back this morning. We're getting a new look at the aftermath of an alleged physical altercation between Gabby Petito and her fiance, Brian Laundrie, on August 12th. In this video, Petito says that she hit Laundrie first during the fight, but later says that he grabbed her face after telling her to shut up. He just grabbed you? Did he, did he hit you, though? I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him, and then I, I understand if he hit you, but we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because you know, I guess, yeah, but I can first. Where did he hit you? No, don't worry, just well, be honest. He like grabbed my face, just like, I guess. Uh -huh. um, he didn't like hit me in the face, like he didn't like punch me in the face or anything. Did he slap but, your face or what? Well, like he like grabbed me like with his nail, and I guess that's why it was. I definitely have a cut right here, so I could feel it. Yeah. Like, and now there are new developments shedding light on Landry's whereabouts in the days before he disappeared. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park has the story. More than two weeks since his disappearance and Brian Laundrie is still nowhere to be found. But officials say they're now analyzing new evidence linked to the fiancé turned person of interest in the disappearance of Gabby Petito. The FBI returned to the Laundrie family home in Florida, looked at the camper parked in the driveway and left with what appeared to be a small cooler. 
The Laundry family attorney, C. Bertolino, said the agents collected personal items belonging to Brian that will assist canines in their search. Bertolino also confirmed that the FBI is in possession of a phone Brian purchased September 4th, adding that he opened the account through AT&T, left the phone the day he went hiking on September 14th, and never returned. Prior to his disappearance, Bertolino said the family stayed at the Fort DeSoto campground September 6th and 7th and all left together. A Florida sheriff's office says it handed over surveillance footage from that park to the FBI, and there have been no confirmed sightings or reports of Brian in Pinellas County. As the manhunt intensifies, Gabby's family, friends, and even strangers are anxiously waiting for a break in the case. We got to keep the momentum going, keep it strong, because eventually he's going to be found. This week, Gabby's family spoke publicly for the first time since her body was discovered nearly two weeks ago in a Wyoming campground. We don't stop, you know, remembering Gabby and keeping her name out there and, and fighting for, for other people out there like her. Their tragedy turning into a new calling for other families with missing children. Right now, Landry is the FBI's prime person of interest in Petito's death, but is not a suspect. And now to the dangerous journey migrants are making to the U.S. border with Mexico. Our partners at Telemundo investigated how some people heading to America are now becoming the target of kidnappings. Juan Cooper hears some of their heartbreaking stories and a warning this report contains descriptions that some viewers may find disturbing. For thousands of migrants heading north to the United States, their journey through Mexico is one paved with danger. A group of armed men were waiting for us. They took my bag and they put me face down on the ground. David Sanabria remembers how he and his four-year-old daughter Jimena were met by armed men when they arrived in Mexico. They left Honduras last year. They paid a coyote that was supposed to take them to the U.S.-Mexico border. But when they got there, they say they were handed to a group of kidnappers. They told me that they were from the Golfo cartel. <laughs> they were taken to the desert, joining 50 other migrants. That's when they say the kidnappers called his brother Dennis, who lives in the United States, demanding $7,500 for his release. His story one that is becoming more and more common. Over the past year, Telemundo investigative team spoke with over 30 migrants, among them women and children, all of who claim survived a kidnapping. <laughs> Videos like these leaving some family members with no choice but to pay thousands of dollars for their loved one's safety. All of them in makeshift camps across the border that have become a hunting ground for kidnappers. With so many disappearances, migrants are forced to keep an eye out at night. We don't want the kids to go out a lot or by themselves. Berta Hernandez bears the scars of what can happen when the ransom is not paid. She's saying as soon as you're taken, the first thing they do is take your phone. They see who you're talking to, and the only messages they found were with my mom. It was a U.S. phone number, just one, and all they saw was money. David says that when he and his daughter were taken, it was his brother Dennis who got the call. I pleaded with them that I didn't have the money to pay them. I didn't know how. When my brother would tell them that he didn't have the money, they would hit me and throw me on the ground. David says he witnessed how others were dismembered when they didn't have the money. They would dismember them and kill them with machetes. He says he was forced to eat the meat of those who were killed. They forced us to eat their meat so there wouldn't be any remains left. Dennis claims he sold everything he could to help his brother. He asked for borrowed money, but was only able to raise half of the amount they asked for. At that moment, I heard my brother pleading, brother, Brother, if you can't get the money now, just let them cut me into pieces. Despite the recent increase in migrants, neither the Mexican nor the U.S. government has been able to deter cartels from kidnapping migrants along the border. Unprecedented number of migrants. This year, Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas made it a mission to dismantle organized crime dedicated to human trafficking. 
As of today, 1,500 individuals are being investigated, but no one has been arrested. Dennis eventually paid $7,500 for their rescue. He showed us how he made seven separate payments, all to different women, a method that criminals use to avoid any suspicion. His brother and niece were eventually freed near the Rio Grande by the Texas-Mexico border. I put her on my back and I told her to hold on tight, and I made it. I made it across the river. Three months after trying to seek asylum in the U.S., the U.S. government granted them a humanitarian parole allowing this family to reunite. For a moment, we thought it was over. That would not be able to meet our goal, to be here, together. But with God, everything is possible. And that was Telemundo's Juan Cooper with that important report. Thank you so much. Now, let's take a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. Matt Butner joins us now from Moscow. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, guys. Happy Friday. Let's kick this off today with North Korea, which says that it has test fired a newly developed anti-aircraft missile. This actually marks the fourth time in the past several weeks that North Korea has conducted tests of new weapons. Uh, they resumed these tests uh, was it early last month uh, after a nearly six month kind of hiatus in weapons tests. But today, unlike the three previous tests we saw, which actually saw much more significant scales of weapons used. We have not yet seen any U.S. reaction to this, but keep an eye out. Moving along now, we have some very good news for those who have been wanting to travel to Australia for work or for family as well. Uh, the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said today that the government is preparing plans to open Australia's borders and lift a ban on overseas travel by November. That's actually earlier than expected. Travelers will still, however, generally be required to show proof of vaccination and there will be a quarantine on return to Australia. And finally, we go to Spain, where Shakira was attacked by two wild boars. Uh, the singer said in an Instagram story that the two animals tried to take her bag from her, run off with it into the woods. She did recover the bag, said that it was destroyed and so were uh, its contents, or at least they were damaged. Uh, interestingly, it appears that wild boar incidents are on the rise globally, at least according to what? this sample <laughs> set. Uh, last week, videos cir circulated showing them wandering around Rome. So keep an eye out. Oh my. <laughs> I don't even know how to react to that. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, actually, you answered my question. I was gonna say, in the middle of Barcelona, do wild boars attack her? My God, don't they know who she is? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt, thank you so much. That was a fun Friday one. We hope she's okay, though. All right, coming up, Texas parents of transgender children are taking the fight for their kids' rights to the state house. Yeah, not only are they standing up for their kids, they are winning. Our conversation with one mom's crusade against dozens of anti-transgender bills is next. All right, the first Super Bowl in Los Angeles in almost 30 years has a halftime performance that is fit for Hollywood. Yeah, it does. The NFL says Dr. Dre, Kendrick Lamar, Eminem, Snoop Dogg, and Mary J. Blige will all perform together. The packed lineup features a number of L.A. natives who will take the stage at the stadium in Inglewood, California. And talk about star power. The five musicians have a combined 43 oh Grammy goodness. Awards. 22 number one albums on the Billboard 200. And not that anyone asked Savannah, but I have zero awards and zero <laughs> number one anything. So good for them. <laughs> that is quite a lineup, though. Really? I also yeah. like when you know that there's going to be multiple performers. You know, yes. sometimes there's like a surprise, but it's always more fun when there's, there's, there's a bunch of for everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very Great. exciting. Thanks, Allison. Mm -hmm. All right, now, Texas parents of transgender children are rallying against dozens of bills, taking the fight for their kids to the state capitol. One mom of a non-binary child said this, just the conversation of whether or not my child should exist in public school sports and whether or not other kids should bully them for who they are, that's the conversation that this legislative body is inviting by entertaining these bills. Joining us now is NBC Out reporter Joe Yurkeba, a familiar face here on this show, and Rachel Gonzalez, who has been to the Texas State House dozens of times to lobby on behalf of her transgender daughter, Libby. Good morning to both of you, and thank you so much for your time. Rachel, thank you for joining us. Joe, I'll start with you and with some background info. So what actions and legislation have lawmakers proposed on a state level in Texas? Just set the scene for us here. 
Sure. You can take a look at this first graphic we have here. So Republican lawmakers in Texas have proposed 52 anti-trans bills, most of which target trans youth or trans minors, and that's just this year. So to give you an idea of how many that is, that's a quarter of the 190 anti-trans bills filed in state legislatures nationwide this year, according to the ACLU of Texas. And among those bills are bills that ban trans student athletes from competing on school sports teams that align with their gender identity, and bills that would ban or even criminalize certain gender affirming health care for transgender minors, including even talk therapy. Um, and some of these bills could even charge parents with child abuse if they provide such care for their kids. So far, yeah. none of these bills have become law, but the state Senate just last week passed a trans athlete ban, and it and two other similar House bills have been referred to House committees in the Texas legislature. And now with that scene set, Rachel, let me bring you in here. And first, let me say thank you for sh sharing your family's story with us here this morning. And just tell us when you decided to start protesting for your daughter, Libby. What led to that? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so we actually just had our five-year anniversary of our first um, public video that we ever made. And uh, my daughter Libby is 11, so she was six at the time. And um, we didn't really see any other way around it. We didn't anticipate this extended battle, we thought we were just headed into um, a bathroom bill battle. And because my daughter is fully supported in her schools, it wasn't something that we were facing on the daily. And we had the bandwidth to show up and fight for kids who were being discriminated against on a daily basis in their schools, in their homes. And, um, and here we are five years later, still fighting the same fight and showing up again and again to uh, to let the Texas legislature know that you can't use transgender youth as your political pawns. I have more questions for you on just that in just a moment. But Joe, first, just tell us, tell us also what's going on across the country. I mean, Texas is not the only state pushing these sorts of laws. Other state houses have proposed legislation also targeting transgender children. Tell us how widespread are these bills and what impacts are they having nationwide? Sure. So about 30 states have considered trans athlete bans this year. And at this point, governors in nine states, eight so far this year, have signed trans athlete bans into law. About 20 states have considered bans on gender affirming care for trans minors. And governors in two states, Arkansas and Tennessee, have signed laws that restrict or ban that care. And as far as the impact they're having, I actually just spoke with Ricardo Martinez at Equality Texas last night, and he told me that they are receiving heartbreaking phone calls every week from parents whose trans children are being bullied at school more, and some have even been violently attacked. So the, the rhetoric in these bills is really affecting LGBTQ youth. And now, Rachel, I think a lot of times we hear these bills and we hear and see politicians talking about them and debating them and and we're not focusing on the families and the humans who are right in the middle of it. So tell me, what do you hope for your daughter, for her future? And how far are you willing to go to keep her safe? I mean, is there a chance that you'd move to another state or do you feel that that might come to that? No, um, my daughter is a fifth generation Texan. We're not leaving. They're not going to run us out of our home. Um, that's ridiculous. And, you know, our community, the people that know my family, the people that know my daughter fully support her exactly as she is. And, you know, I think uh, we're called mama bears for a reason. And there's really nothing we aren't going to do to defend the safety and well being of not just my own kid, but kids across the state, because there are countless trans youth across the state that cannot safely go to the Capitol and testify. And, um, and we do have that ability. So we're going to keep pushing and um, and showing my daughter that all of my all three of my children, that we if somebody is being um, targeted in this state, we're going to stand up together. Rachel Gonzalez, thank you for sharing your family's struggle right now with us and opening up about your daughter. And Joe, your cable, always great to have you on the show. Thank you both so much. Thank you so much for thank having you. me. Coming up, recalls, eco-friendly travel, and a 50-year Disney anniversary airplane. That sounds pretty cool. And that sounds like it's time for Vicki Wynn to give us our favorite segment of the week. Good to know. That's up next. Welcome back. And now we've got our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Bertha Coombs joins us now. Bertha, good morning. Hi, Bertha. 
Hey, happy Friday, ladies. So a warning from Neiman Marcus. They say a data breach affected the online accounts of nearly 5 million customers. The retailer says the data may have included names, contact information, credit card numbers, and user names uh, for accounts and passwords. Neiman says it recently learned about the breach, which occurred in May of last year. It believes there's no evidence accounts from Bergdorf Goodman were affected by that. Meantime, Zoom is terminating a nearly $15 billion dollar deal to buy Five9, a company that makes software for call centers. It would have been Zoom's biggest ever acquisition. The move comes after Five9 shareholders voted that deal down. Two well-known stock advisory firms had recommended that they reject the sales, citing concerns about future growth. And the FAA is going to review safety concerns raised by a former employee at Blue Origin. That's the space company founded by former Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. Now, in an essay posted online, the former head of employee communications and 20 other unnamed current and former workers say that Blue Origin fosters a dangerous work environment where sexist and toxic conduct is perpetrated or ignored by senior leadership. In a statement, Blue Origin says it has no tolerance for discrimination or harassment and will investigate claims of misconduct. Not a great look. No, it's not. That's an important That's one that we'll you. be watching, especially as we talk about this billionaire space race so much. Bertha, thank you. And now this morning, here's what we teased, our favorite segment, a recall from Macy's, a new way to shop, plus new technology for Disney lovers. Here's NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn with this week's Good, good to, to Know. know. <laughs> Hey, good morning. We start with an important alert from Macy's, the company announcing a recall of about 30,000 Martha Stewart oil and vinegar containers after it received six reports of the glass breaking and causing injuries. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission says people should return the product to stores for a refund. You can visit cpsc.gov for more details. If you're doing some early bird holiday shopping, be on the lookout for this new feature from Google. The company just announced an enhanced version of Google lens that will soon be available for iOS users. Whether on a phone or a computer, the tool will make all images on a screen shoppable. So if you see something you like, just click a button on the Chrome browser to view retail search results and similar products. The company did not say when the feature would be available. Speaking of Google, the company is also trying to make eco-friendly traveling easier than ever. Starting this week, travelers will see a new badge next to hotel search results that provides information about the building's sustainability sustainability practices, and in order to be certified, hotels have to provide information about energy use, water conservation, waste reduction, and sustainable sourcing. Heading on that Disney vacation soon, you might want to book through Southwest Airlines. To celebrate its joint 50th anniversary with Walt Disney World, Southwest Airlines just unveiled a Disney-themed airplane. The aircraft features images of favorite Magic Kingdom characters and will make direct flights from around the country to Orlando, Florida. Southwest will also be giving away Disney vacation packages every day through November 16th. Just visit the airline's website for more information. Finally, bring more magic to your home with a new Disney-themed Amazon Echo for kids. The device unveiled this week is called Hey Disney and claims to bring movie characters to life through games, bedtime stories, and other features. For News Now, I'm Vicki Wynn, and that's good to know. <laughs> Always is. <laughs> right. Coming up, our continuing celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month right here in the halls of 30 Rock. Yeah, it's very cool. We have stories from our own NBC News Now team sharing how they stay true to who they are. That's up next. We are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month here at NBC News Now by bringing you the stories of the Latino staff who make up NBC. From the person who makes the coffee to the person who signs off on a final script, each one has a unique story. I'm from Honduras. I was born and raised back there. My mom is from El Salvador and my dad is from Puerto Rico. And I am from Mexico. When I was 15 years old, I came to this country. Uh, I came here as an immigrant. Uh, wasn't the easiest, the safest, or the best way to come here. When I got to this country, I was caught by ice, and you know, I was with them for like 15, 20 days, and finally, um, you know, once I got here, it wasn't easy. Um, 
It took me about four years to finally say that I, you know, I'm part of this country because I didn't speak, I didn't speak any English when I came here and, and look at me now, now I do and, and I, I'm here working on NBC now and it's a huge opportunity. Um, the people are so nice. There are so many people like me that I, you know, it makes me feel like there's family here. I always was that weird kid that loved the news, uh, and my mom loved them as well. My whole family did, and it was one of those opportunities that, aside from knowing what was going on in our community, even the B-roll of people scrolling through their phones, I want to make sure that I'm having a hand that belongs to a woman in addition to one of a man, one that has more pigmentation than one that doesn't, and being intentional in that, because I know know there are a lot more Ignacios out there that I want to give them a wink that their stories can also be told. We have so much to offer. Everyone has a different voice. Everyone comes from a different background, a different culture. And um, for me, journalism is a way to kind of voice those stories and give everyone a platform to talk about the things and the stories that made them who they are today. And for me, I'm always looking for inspirational stories of role models and someone who can just, you know, be representation for anyone, regardless of what they're going through, because I think that that's an important voice to have, especially in the media, and really give them a platform to be able to tell their story so others can see themselves in other people the way that I wish I saw myself and others when I was growing up. Nine years later, I'm here, and I can say that the American dream is something that is real, and we come here for, for a reason, we come here for, uh, make life better, not just for us, but for our families. We are hard worker people. El orgullo de ser Latino es el saber de que puedo hacer no solamente los que mis compañeros del trabajo pueden hacer, pero mucho más. For me, I always wanted to be that role model for others and be a representation and show others, you know, you can do whatever it is that you want to do, no matter where your family is from, no matter what language you speak, what your culture is, you can go out there and achieve whatever it is you want. Oh my goodness, we just love, love, love those team members. Brianna's on our team. It's so good to see her on there. It's so inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. And that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.